this is what we're going to be covering today. So we'll talk about what IP is and why you as business owners should care about it. We'll go over all of the relevant intellectual property and information rights. And finally, we'll talk about ownership, profit and protection. We are going to be focusing on UK law today just to keep the scope manageable. But please bear in mind that you will be able to get protection internationally for things like trademarks and patents. We're going to be using some abbreviations today, though we'll try to keep it to a minimum. You can see the main ones here on the screen. OK, let's get started. Intellectual property is everywhere, and I'm going to prove it to you by the help of this photo. Here you see a man having breakfast by his computer, working on something which uh, I'd imagine is a very familiar scene for all of us uh, during these modern times. And this photo contains everything that we're going to be talking about today. First of all, in the computer, we have different components that are protected by patents and the tech industry also relies on trade secrets a lot uh, in order to get advantages on the market and to protect key information. Secondly, the software that this man is using to write up his work is protected by copyright as a literary work. Thirdly, the furniture and crockery that's uh, in this picture is protected by design right, which is all about the 3D aspects of products. And finally, the cereal that this guy is eating is probably branded and elements of that brand can be protected by trademark. So things like name, lettering uh, and colors. So this photo demonstrates to you that intellectual property is all about creativity um, and innovation. And it can come in many shapes and different forms. Um, lots of different rights can interact in one product or service. So keep an open mind when you're looking at intellectual property in your product or service. Now, the next question in your minds might be, why should I care? Well, there's two different advantages uh, in intellectual property rights to businesses. The first one is that it can help you create revenue by way of licensing or sale of your intellectual property. On the other hand, intellectual property can also protect your revenue um, in a passive or an active way by acting as a barrier to the market or if you're actively enforcing your rights against people trying to piggyback on your innovation to the market. So the benefits, they're there, they're important, they're major. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Guillaume now to talk about all of the rights that are important to you. Thank you, Pauline, and hello everyone. As has been mentioned, my name is Guillaume, and I'm going to uh, talk to you about the core elements of the IP rights. And to help us with that, I'm going to tell you a story, the, the adventure of Marie Curie Jr., a brilliant young entrepreneur that is uh, actually the descendants, of course, of the Marie Curie Senior, the two times Nobel Prize winner. And we're talking about her because she came up with five new brilliant and revolutionary ideas. The first one, uh, a special beverage, top secret, uh, made with all sorts of exotic and mysterious ingredients. The second one is a way of distinguishing her products, her beverage from other competitors in a also, I believe, revolutionary way um, that no one has ever seen before. Uh, she also made a bottle, created a bottle with a special nozzle that prevents the beverage from losing any carburation. She designed this whole new, uh, she created this whole new industrial process which allows her to produce both the beverage and the bottles with a high yield capacity. And finally, she came up with this revolutionary software. You should see it, it's the Curie Soft Office and allows her employees to just perform everyday tasks such as math or writing with ease and efficiency. She went to an IP lawyer and asked a series of questions how she could protect her uh, rights and products. And the first one was, do I need copyright protection? Well, copyright is the expression of ideas and your work must fall into one of these categories, literary, database, sound recordings, or typographical arrangements of published works. And it must be original, meaning that you cannot copy the work from other people, and it must originate from the author itself. Um, it lasts for the life of the author and 70 years afterwards. So if someone dies today and has some work um, published, it will be protected until 2091, March 25th. Uh, the, do you need to register your rights? Um, no, you don't, thank God. You only need to fix it and in some sort of physical uh, body, be it write a book or a CD-ROM, 
depending on which situation. Thank God Microsoft is protecting the literary category. What do you get? You get exclusive rights, such as copy your own work. You get more rights, such as to be identified as the author of that work. But on the other side, people like me that don't have these brilliant innovative ideas have certain exceptions in which we are allowed to use the work of other people without infringing their copyrights. Now, how is my curricola stylization protected? Trademarks are a sign by which consumers identify the origin, the manufacturer or provider, of a product or service. And this works like this diagram. It's you have the producer, you have the products, and there's a link between them, between them, which conveys all sorts of information to consumers. So consumers know that the product they're buying is from that given producer. So to know the origin, to attract customers, if you have a reputation built upon your product of high quality, you will attract customers through that trademark. And some special information, such as luxury or status, or in this case, whomever drinks Curicola is cool, and who doesn't, it's not. The right lasts for 10 years, but it's infinitely renewable, meaning that you can protect it forever. But you have the obligation to use it within five years since registration to avoid bad faith. And this is bad faith in registration for trademarks is no intention of using what you've registered or just the intention of avoiding others to register that trademark. In terms of rights, you get the exclusive right to use it and the possibility of authorizing licensing or assigned so-called sale of, um, of your trademark. But the registration works on a first come first serve basis, meaning that it doesn't matter if you are chronologically the first person to have designed it or created it, it matters that you are the first person arriving to the registry office. The link is actually a complex uh, concept because it encompasses a lot of things. And I know we are law students, but let's do a little bit of math and one of the things that is included is curricula, uh, the name itself, of course. But there are other aspects that can also be protected, such as the shape of the goods of package, because they have a unique design, the way the letters are designed, as it is on the symbol that Marie has designed. And this together forms the brand or business name. And the third aspect that is also encompassed by this link, by the trademark, is the goods to which it will be applied. So it's in this situation, it would look something like this. The curricola, the bottle, the way the bottle is designed, and the beverage itself. So it's, let's say it would be the name, the way the name is designed, like a symbol, and the beverage, to, the beverage, the products to which it's applied, in this case, a beverage. All of these aspects, even sounds and smells, are registrable in the UK. So how does this really work? And when you go to the intellectual property office, you have to have all of these elements gathered, which is the name of your brand, the goods to which it will be applied, and the territory in which you wish to be protected. And it works like this diagram. And we will use the example of Lotus. Lotus is a trademark registered for sports cars, computer software, and shoes. And these are all registered in the UK and there's the same trademark and you might ask how is this possible I just told you that it works on the first come first serve basis and you have exclusive rights well this is possible because of an international court called NIST classification which um, kind of distinguish products based on markets so that is you can have the, the same trademark if the products do not touch in terms of consumers so it will never happen as someone wants to buy shoes named Lotus and ends, ends up buying a sports car. It doesn't happen, so it's possible to have the same uh, trademark. Uh, the territory in which you want to be protected is also relevant because you'll only be protected in that jurisdiction. In this case, it could be the UK or it could be the EU or the US or China, it depends. Um, registrability. Registrability is a um, requirements that your trademark must um, follow in order to be registrable. And the first one is no confusion. So if you want to create a brand of shoelaces and you want to brand them 
lotus. Even if shoelaces are in a different category of the NIST classification than shoes, this is a mere formality. And of course, the registration office will not allow you to register that because that will create confusion. Someone will think that they're buying shoelaces from the lotus shoes that they're actually buying from you, and that's not possible. No deception. Of course, if someone has a brand of glasses made of glass and they name them crystal, that will most likely lead people to believe they're buying crystal glasses while they're buying just normal glasses. So no deceptive uh, trademarks <clears throat> and no purely descriptive names. This means that if you are in a certain industry, for instance, the Apple industry, you cannot use the name Apple because that would deprive other Apple producers from um, Reg, so for using that name as a descriptive for their products. Uh, but it's okay if you want to use it for a completely unrelated business such as electronics, and we know Apple is a very well-known brand. And if I do not register, Marie was aware that it, it is possible to not register a trademark. And if you wish to do so, you, you can and you should use the symbol TM to demonstrate ownership, and you are protected under the passing off action. In the UK and it has two requirements ownership of goodwill reputation and you must also prove there was an authorized act, uh, use of your uh, trademark and it results in damages to you comparing them both unregistered versus registered you have certain up, upsides and downsides to it so if you want to live it unregistered of course you will not pay any fees or costs of registration but you have to be aware that passing off actions are really difficult to, to prove because most young trademarks, let's call it like that, um, do not have enough reputation. Reputation is something that is built maybe 10, 20, 50 years in the market and it's really difficult to make use of the only protection that you have. While registered trademarks are assets, very valuable assets and can deter infringement, but of course have the costs associated with it. So it's, um, as a law student, I would advise to, I would say, okay, limit liabilities, but uh, it's really a business strategy, so, uh, yes. Do I want to patent? What are patents? Uh, patents protect new inventions, which represent an inventive step, a step forward in innovation and have industrial application. To be protected um, in the patent uh, regime, you just need to apply in the patent office and you need to be successful in that application. But do you want to register? Does Marie want to register anything as a patent? She has to take into account the nature of the innovation, the nature of protection, and the costs associated because sometimes people most will be divided amongst patented or just keep it a secret because it really depends. If there's costs, there's um, maybe if the invention is too exposed to, to employees or to third parties, uh, maybe you want to to, to patent it and get formal protection. But if it is not, maybe just keep it a secret. Anyway, if you are successful, you get a 20-year monopoly right. And this means that you are the oops, absolute owner of it for 20 years. No one can come up with the same idea or register or use it in the, reg in the jurisdiction in which you have registered your patents. What can you patent? There's mechanical devices, industrial processes, chemical compounds, and mixtures of compounds. Of course, Marie will patent her industrial process because it, would, because it will be exposed to all of her employees and it would be just better to protect it and be sure for 20 years than uh, try to keep it a secret. But what about keeping it a secret? Well, trade secrets are specific confidential information treated as secret which grants competitive advantage and thus being commercially valuable. Protection in the UK is made through two different uh, regulations, regimes, and they have very similar requirements. The, the trade secrets regulation is only applicable to cases after 19th June of 2018, but they're very, very, very similar, uh, with the exception of the third bullet point on trade secrets regulation, in which um, they ask, in order to be considered as a secret, have you taken the steps to maintain it as a secret? Have you done that work? Anyway, the most used methods in any commercial uh, business is the NDA. So meaning that if you are handling with third parties uh, some sort of secrets, 
you will just sign an NDA and that most of the times might will work. Practical steps to maintain secrecy. There are six of them. Um, and there are some examples of trade secrets, such as the Google search engine algorithm, uh, secret recipes, and customer lists. In this case, Marie chose to keep her beverage secret because only she has to know it. She will add the final ingredients. Uh, so let's just keep it a secret. Finally, how do I protect the bottle? Uh, design rights protect the shape or configuration of the whole or part of the product. So everything that is 3D might be protected under the design rights if it has a functional property. And it's, this might get confusing because you might think, is it a patent or uh, what about the other design rights? Well, they don't qualify as patents because they're not an innovation. They're a functionality. They don't have like a next step into, um, into progress or something. They're just uh, maybe an improvement uh, with a functional nature. So they're purely functional and non-aesthetic. The requirements are threefold, and you have and it has to be original, it must be a functional part, and it must be recorded in the design documents, or you must make articles based on that design. The duration of such rights is 15 years since you have registered on a design document, or 10 years since it has been made first available in the market. Be aware that the, the designer must use the design. Some examples are agricultural tools, for instance, an improved shovel, <laughs> it could be a hot water bottle, for instance, let's take a closer look. You could protect, you could protect the whole bottle because it has that, uh, the way it's designed, it has a functional purpose. You could protect the nozzle, for instance, to prevent the loss of carbonation, but you could not protect this 2D engraving on the bottle because that would be aesthetical. So this would be protected, for instance, under registered designs. Now Marie knows uh, all about mostly the basics of IP rights and can take a conscious decision about which protection she wants. Pauline, please. All right. Um, so now that you know about the rights, let's talk about what you can do with the rights and start with ownership. The most important question um, when you're dealing with intellectual property is who owns it? Um, the rule of thumb here is that the person who creates or invents uh, the product um, is its first owner. However, there are three special groups that we're going to be um, talking about today because the rules are a little bit different. The first of those groups is employees. The rule with employees is that if they create something that can be protected by an intellectual property rights during the normal course of their employment, their employer owns the intellectual property in that creation. So if you hire a scientist to make you a formula for a certain product and they come up with um, another invention that relates to the work that they're doing, you would own the intellectual property. However, if they write a romance novel during their lunch break, you have no rights over that because it doesn't coincide with their normal duties. The possible difficulties with employees arise from the fact that it's not clear what the duties are um, or the contracts don't reflect those. So what you want to make sure as an employer is that your employee understands your relationship and the rules on IP and that their contract accurately reflects um, their duties, especially if they become more senior in the business uh, or the duties suddenly change. The second key group are third parties. So if you commission somebody to make software for you, for example, um, the rules here are different because the third party doesn't have an employment relationship with you. They actually own what they create. So what you want to do from day one is to have a contract that says any IP that you create um, during this engagement is something that belongs to the business. You can require a third party to assign all of their intellectual property rights to you. And in cases of copyright and design right, you can also require them to assign future rights over to you. Um, now, we mentioned moral rights in the copyright section earlier on this presentation. Um, what you want to make sure if the works that they are creating are copyrightable is that they actually waive those moral rights so that you have full control over the asset. And finally, joint owners or joint authors. This is where two or more people will come together to create something and their effort is indistinguishable from each other. So you can't tell um, from the final product who did what. 
In these cases, every single one of those people has a stake in the ownership of this work. And you can't do anything with that asset before asking every single one of those people involved. So what do you do in a situation like that or in any of these situations where it seems a little bit difficult to use the asset or to profit from it properly? Well, you want to make sure that the business owns all of the intellectual property that relates to it. In this way, you can protect the asset much easier. Um, it's easier to commercialize it. Uh, and you can obviously then pay all of these people who have been involved in the process from the profits of the business and save yourself a lot of trouble. Moving on to how do you actually make money from intellectual property? The first way is licensing. This is where you give somebody uh, a right to use your exclusive rights in the intellectual property. And it's kind of the same thing as if you would rent a room from your house. You still own the house, but you've just given somebody else a permission to use one of the rooms for a specified purpose for a certain amount of time. There's different kinds of licenses, and the one you choose depends on the commercial situation, the product, the market, what you want to achieve, and so on. The first of these is the exclusive license. This is where only the IP licensee has a right to use the intellectual property. So this excludes the owner of the intellectual property as well. This is a good choice if the licensee is willing to invest a lot of money in a new technology or laboratories or R&D or testing to make sure that that product actually gets on the market. The second kind of license is a sole license. This is where there's only one license, but the intellectual property owner can still also use the IP. And the final kind of license is a non-exclusive license. This is where the IP owner can grant multiple licenses and continue using the IP themselves. This would be your choice if you want to try and maximize profits or if you want to go international, have different regions, or just divide the different actions relating to um, your, your intellectual property asset to different people. Here are some top tips for licensing. It's not a legal requirement for all of these to have the licenses in writing. However, it's good commercial practice to have written contracts, primarily because then this is an objective piece of paper that everybody's agreed to um, and it can reduce disputes in the future. It's also easier to just refer back to that um, at a later date. You also want to record all of the licenses in the Intellectual Property Office database to show to other people, to third parties who might be interested in doing business with you or who are interested in the asset, um, that there are certain licenses on it already. You also want to make sure that you control everything that happens with the property, including sub-licensing. This is where your licensee grants another license to somebody else. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a popular commercial practice and can be really useful in some certain um, circumstances, but you do need to know as the owner of that right what's going on with it. Um, so what you'd want to include in your contract is that in order to grant a sub-license, the licensee would have to contact you 30 days in advance in writing to ask for permission. Obviously, you also want to know that you're working with somebody who can help you, your business, your assets advance. So you want to carefully consider who you're working with. You also want to make sure the obligations of the different parties are clear, namely who pays for what, uh, including the upkeep costs of trademarks and patents. Royalties are the payments that are coming to you. You'll have to agree how frequently they're paid, what their amount is. And finally, it's good to be clear on termination as well. How can it happen? Who can um, ask to terminate the contract? Does it come to an end? Is there an end date? All of that kind of stuff. The thing to keep in mind for licenses and all contracts is that you um, keep a channel of communication open um, with the other party. All right, so moving on to assignment, which is the other way of making money from the intellectual property. Uh, this is selling your intellectual property, so the equivalent of selling your house. Once you sell your IP, you lose the right to use it. If you sell your house, you cannot go back and live there anymore. Now, these must be in writing and they must be signed because they are major transactions. The benefits are that you get paid upfront and you have no further responsibilities over the intellectual property, which could be good if it's really expensive or difficult for you to maintain. But the downsides are that if the asset does become incredibly valuable, um, you will have no claim to those profits, nor will you be able to control the future of the IP, for example, the image of a certain trademark. The top tips for assignment are that you need to make sure you actually want to do this. Um, it's very difficult to go back on sales. Uh, and finally, also to record assignments with the Intellectual Property Office. All right, that was profiting from your IP. Let's talk about protection. 
Guillermo talked about registration for some of the rights, including trademarks and patents. Um, you can also register design documents for 3D designs, and obviously the aesthetic designs can be registered. If this is an option, do it, because it will give you more um, leverage in cases of disputes. I've mentioned recording a few times now. This is good for evidential purposes and for communicating to third parties. Intellectual property notices, Guillermo also mentioned um, the trademark notice already, but you can see them on the screen. You may have seen the C um, in different places before. And these are a free and very easy way to signal to others that the product in question is protected by an intellectual property right. If you use these, you should also include your name and the year. You also want to keep good personal records. I think this goes without saying in any business, but whatever happens to your IP, you should make sure that you note it down including takedown notices from websites such as Facebook or Alibaba um, if someone does infringe on your rights. In terms of agreeing work to work with others um, and contracts, you want to make sure that all of the contracts are written and they are very, very detailed, okay? Because that will save you a lot of trouble, a lot of headaches um, from the future, and it's a good way to act proactively um, in commercial situations. Please note that you can't actually prevent someone from creating a similar thing to yours independently of you. So if I write a book um, and somebody else writes a book that's very similar to mine, but they've never heard of my book or they don't know me, um, I actually can't do anything about it because they've come up with it independently. I can only stop them if they have copied my work. The only exception to this is patents, which as Guillaume said, give you a 20 year monopoly over everything that happens with that specific invention. You also want to be mindful of the Intellectual Property Unjustified Threats Act of 2017, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically means that you cannot go around threatening to sue people if you suspect infringement of your intellectual property rights. If you suspect infringement of your intellectual property rights, please get in touch with a lawyer to discuss your next steps to avoid um, the risks of this act. Now, this has been a lot of information in a very short amount of time and you may be feeling overwhelmed. Again, I'd like to remind you that you will be getting these slides and further resources after this session. But if you want to start thinking about this um, immediately after our talk today, you can think of it like a jigsaw puzzle. So sit down, think about your product or your service and all of the different aspects of it that might be protected by intellectual property rights. Um, we see here all of the different rights and Guillaume, if you click through, we can see that some of these are intimately connected. So copyright and trademarks, copyright and design rights, and patents and trade secrets. If you take your product and you look at this IP rights um, as a jigsaw puzzle, you really will get to know everything um, as in depth as possible. And the more you know about your product and these different rights and how they interact, the better able you will be to not only protect your product, but also to benefit from these intellectual property rights and make a profit.